Anybody have any questions from last time? Endocrine system. to show this image. There we go. All right, so if somebody would lower the... Did we go through this slide for this section? Okay. Did we, go... we didn't do these. I don't think I did this with any section. Okay, so these are the hormones that are produced by the anterior pituitary Gland. Remember the difference. The posterior pituitary is a storage vesicle for the hypothalamus, and you've got oxytocin, an antidiuretic hormone, in there, right? That they're released. And the analogy was made to um, the gallbladder being the storage vesicle for the liver, right? And bile. So, thyroid stimulating hormone is a plus hormone in the sense that it is a stimulating hormone for the thyroid gland to produce two hormones, actually there's three, but we'll only focus on two, T3 and T4. So when people say they have low thyroid hormone, what they actually mean is that these two are low. Now of those two, right, T4 is not very active. T3 is very active. Right, so this one, 80, 80 to 90 percent of thyroid activity. This one is somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of that. So what that means is that this is basically a storage form. When you make T4, it doesn't do very much, okay? But having it circulating through your blood when you need it, because what ends up happening is you have to cleave an iodine molecule off, and that's the difference, right? So you cleave an iodine molecule off, it becomes T3. T3 is the active form. That's the one you want to have lots of. Okay. So TSH stimulates the thyroid hormone to produce these. There's another one, but you don't need to know it. It's not, it's outside the scope of this class. Okay. Adrenocorticotropic hormone is ACTH, is involved in the stress response, something called the HPA axis. The HPA axis. And that stands for a hypothalamic, and I'll get out of the way in a second, pituitary adrenal axis. So these, there are these axes in the neuroendocrine world that are linked together. There's a signal from the hypothalamus. Remember the hypothalamus is where all of the thermostats are, which then sends a signal down to the pituitary where all of these hormones are produced, which will then, in this case, send a signal to the adrenal gland. So this is part of the stress response. Okay? So ACTH, if you crank up the production of ACTH, you're going to crank up the production of cortisol. Right? So that means you're stressed. Or it's that time of the day. Because cortisol, cortisol is a hormone that's on a circadian rhythm. At about 11 to 12 at night, it's at its lowest level it's going to be during the day. 
and right before you wake up every morning, it peaks. And the reason it peaks is because it's called a glucocorticoid, which means that it starts breaking down fat and sh to give you sugar. So under normal circumstances, if the, if the system works correctly, cortisol is not your enemy. It's catabolic hormone, but it allows you to have a little bit of blood sugar in the morning because in the morning, what have you been doing if you've been sleeping for seven to 10 hours? You've been fasting, and that's why it's so high. The problem with cortisol is when it stays chronically elevated throughout the day. Okay? In other words, it doesn't really come down, and at night, it doesn't really come down. That's when it becomes very catabolic. That's when you start having problems with blood sugar. That's when you start breaking down protein. But under its normal circumstances, the 24-hour cycle, cortisol really breaks down fat. So it's your friend. But when you do lots and lots of things, like you're over-caffeinated, you're under-sleeping, and you're over-stressed, now cortisol becomes your worst enemy, right? The cortisol is not what's making you fat, per se. It's everything else that you're doing that's cranking the cortisol up. So it's not the cortisol's problem. It's your lifestyle problem, right? So, but under normal circumstances, it works just fine. Gonadotropic hormone, right? Gonadotropic hormone, FSH, is follicle-stimulating hormone and LH is luteinizing hormone. Follicle stimulating hormone, both in, so both males and females have all of these hormones. They're all identical, we have them all. How much of each one we have is different. Follicle stimulating causes production of sperm in males and eggs in females. Luteinizing hormone causes and helps with the production of estrogen, but mainly testosterone, okay? And they work together. So if either of these are not being produced at normal levels, then the downstream hormone is not. Prolactin um, is, a, is a really odd hormone in that we don't really know what it does other than after pregnancy in women. After pregnancy in women, it's the hormone that causes milk production. So that one sort of makes sense, right? But males have it too. We don't exactly know what other functions this hormone has. There's some speculation, but nobody really knows. There's not that much prolactin research going on. So we, we, that's the one main function we know. Um, melanocyte stimulating hormone, right? Melanocyte stimulating hormone causes the production of skin color, right? This is upregulating when you're getting a tan. And then finally, growth hormone, okay? And growth hormone, we know what growth hormone does. Growth hormone causes things like gigantism and dwarfism, right? When it's not it, during the, the first part of your life, which you're starting to end now because you're young adults, right? You've had lots and lots, you've had periods of surges of growth hormone. Once your bones are fused, you, the growth hormone will help keep you lean because it helps you burn fat it also help you repair, right? Growth hormone is the reason why a 20-year-old and a 40-year-old go head-to-head -head in any kind of competition that's got any kind of volume in it, and maybe the 40-year-old beats the 20-year-old the first day, maybe the second day, maybe the first week, but that's when it's over because the 40-year-old has roughly half the growth hormone in his or her system that the 20-year-old has. So the 20 year old comes back the next week and says, let's go. And the 40 year old looks at this person and says, I'm done. I, I'm, going, I'm going to have a beer, or I'm going fishing. I, I'm not doing this anymore, this is ridiculous. That's one of the reasons they can't recover fast enough, right? So growth hormone is it, and um, it's your friend throughout life. By the time you're 80 years old, you don't produce much growth hormone anymore on a regular basis. That's, that's one of the issues. All right, any questions on these? So these are all anterior pituitary. So here we have um, an example of what goes wrong with growth hormone, okay? So what you have here are two adult males, 
okay? This is not a little boy. He's an adult male. And this is a pituitary giant. He's over eight feet tall, okay? And this was taken back in uh, the 1800s, late 1800s, early 20th century, okay? And they were part of a circus. Not surprising, right? The tall guy, the really short guy. And so both of these issues are due to growth hormone. In the, in the pituitary giant, he has a tumor somewhere in his body that's producing excessive amounts of growth hormone. The tumor doesn't respond to a negative feedback system, right? Tumor doesn't respond to a negative feedback system. So it doesn't matter how much that tumor pumps out of the growth hormone, it just keeps pumping out more. Where in the normal system, it does respond, okay? So these people, they continue to grow until their bones seal. And then if the, tumor, if the tumor is not taken care of, then the disease progresses into something called acromegalia. And acromegalia is because the, the fingers, the nose, the, the forebrow, okay, continue to grow. Yeah, in some ways, the bone. So they get this Cro-Magnum-like skull that develops. They almost look monstrous. So the, they're not growing any taller, but they have these features that are more like Neanderthal man. That's the problem with it. So, um, yeah, um, back, back when I was a child, there was a, a wrestler named Andre the Giant. Andre the Giant was an acromegaliac giant, okay? And the reason he had that huge head, massive, he actually did this back, back when I was a kid because I used to watch a lot of wrestling because that's what we did back in the day. His hands were so big that he could put his hand over the announcer's head and you couldn't see the announcer's head. That's how big, okay? Um, and he had this really large Cro-Magnum structure. Um, so that's a growth hormone and it's for pituitary tumor. Now, that's not the same as, you know, if there are volleyball players or, or basketball players typically males on this campus that are very, very tall, they don't have tumors. They're just large people. Their genetic makeup is that they, they're large. But that's not the same. Because if they have this problem, they're gonna continue to grow in places they don't want to, right? So that's not the same issue. This man is a pituitary dwarf. So he, he didn't produce enough growth hormone when he was little. And at that time, you know, in early 20th century here, we didn't have any help for people like that. Now, if you are identified as a pituitary dwarf, we can give you artificial growth hormone that will make you grow a little bit more. So if we had had that, he would have been taller. Yeah. So is dwarfism always caused by growth hormone? It, it isn't always. So there are other, there's different types of dwarfism. The kind that I'm showing you here is directly related to growth hormone dwarfism. Okay? And in that case, giving the, the person growth hormone treatments, injections, will help him or her grow. If it's not being caused by growth hormone, then obviously it's not going to help. Okay. So that's just an extreme end of the range, right? This person's about, I don't know, two and a half feet tall to like 30 inches. We little, I mean, right? There's a Yoda doll at Toys R Us, and don't ask me how I know this. I didn't buy one, but apparently the Yoda doll is this tall. And, and so this, this guy would have been about the size of the Yoda doll at Toys R Us. Apparently it's the hot thing. Who would have known? And people my age are buying it. Why? I don't know. I ask myself these questions, but I talk to people, and then I ask myself, why? Did you have the conversation, and why are you buying the doll? But it's complicated. Anyway. All right. So question, name the master gland. Which one of these is the master gland? The hypothalamus, the thyroid, the pituitary brain, or the adrenal gland? Let's go by vote. It's the hypothalamus, the master gland. Yeah, 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, how about the thyroid? Okay, how about the pituitary? It's the pituitary. This is what? The regulator. Right? The regulator because all the thermostats are located. Remember, this, the hypothalamus, is the transition between the brain and the endocrine system. The master gland is the pituitary because it produces more hormones than any other gland in your body. That's the distinction. But they work together as a system. All right, the thyroid gland is attached to the trachea, right? It's underneath the, uh, the thyroid cartilage here, the laryngeal prominence, right? Here you've got your thymus gland. This is the gland that helps T cells mature, part of your um, immune system. This keeps shrinking as you age. Here's your heart, here's your lungs. They, they send the order. The thyroid gland requires iodine to function. Believe it or not, it's becoming a problem again in the United States. In the early 20th century, there was a problem with people not getting enough iodine. So people had things called goiters. Okay, so they're, they're, it would blow up. So the United States government and companies that make salt, like Morton's, decided that they would start adding iodine to salt. It solved the problem. Okay, so back in the early 20th century, people were not fanatical about what they ate like we are now. Okay, just go to a foreign country or have somebody comes in from a foreign country, ask them what they think about the, the insanity in the United States about this craziness around food. They just don't get it. That's how the United States was, you know, 100 years ago. So they decided to put iodine in it. This solved the problem. The problem today is that most of the salt that's out there is not iodized anymore. You actually have to go and find iodized salt. For the better part of my childhood and early adulthood, they all were iodized. Then they decided we don't need it anymore. Why put it in there? Now we've got things like sea salt and all these other things, right? Because salt is terrible for you. Not really, but it's a different issue, right? So you actually have to dig to get iodized salt. If you go to a restaurant, do not put an iodized salt in there. It's more expensive. Why is that a problem? Because your thyroid gland can't function normally. Now you're saying, well, there's no goiters. You still have some iodine you're taking in, but you're probably not taking in enough. If you're an athlete, this is specifically a problem. Maybe the average person doesn't have an issue. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to get a goiter. It just means you don't have enough of it. If you don't have enough of it, you can't make enough T3 and T4. What would what, what be the consequences of that? You slow your metabolism down just enough, a teeny tiny bit. So it's real, it happens to some people, but 100 years ago it wouldn't happen. Yeah. Other sources of iodine, yeah, it's a tricky one. Iodine you can get from a lot of vegetables. That's the other problem, right? And in micro amounts, you're talking to mi micrograms. That's another problem in, in the Western world. We just don't eat enough of them and a variety. And because of that, you don't get enough of it naturally. So that becomes problematic. So if you can't make enough T3 and T4, it could slow down your, your metabolism. Now, does it have a major impact? Probably not. Like I don't see many people walking around with goiters, but it might be enough to slow it down just a tad, okay, just a tad. So again, T4 is the storage portion of this. T3 is when you cleave an iodine molecule. So this is the active version. Yep, man. How would you know that you were the iodine besides the goiter and the Yeah, so the, the, the gold standard for any vitamin or mineral um, deficiencies is you've got to go have a blood test. It's the only way to know for sure. You go, you have a blood test, they can test for all of this. There are tests for this, right? And if you're low, just like vitamin D3, now it's pretty standard when you go to the doctor, they'll, if they do a blood test, they'll actually test for vitamin D3 in the northern part of the country because we know we're deficient. So if you go and you find out that you're deficient in iodine, and let's say that you 
put on a little bit of weight or you're trying to lose some weight and you can't, you can't do that, that may be part of your problem. I'm not saying it's the problem. I'm just saying it may be part of your problem, okay, like a lot of other things. But the only way to know for certain is blood test. Guessing is not a good idea, right? You don't want to overdose on this stuff either because it's not meant to be overdosed on. And that's where the problem starts. Oh, I'm just going to go out and buy iodine tablets. Yeah, not a good idea. Okay, you also have calcitonin. We've also talked about calcitonin in calcium regulation, right? This one was when calcium is high, right? But remember, it doesn't do much in humans, only in rats. Um, hyperthyroidism, right? So you have hyper and hypothyroidism. If you're if your thyroid is functioning way too fast, you can also get a goiter, right? And what would happen? Like Oprah Winfrey is a classic example. She has diagnosed hyperthyroidism. Hypo, excuse me. Um, hyper, who's got hyperthyroidism? Uh, hyperthyroidism. I don't think I have an example of that one. Hypo, Oprah Winfrey's on the other side. So hyperthyroidism, you'd, you'd be really, really thin. Like you could never put on weight. Now, doesn't if you have it, if it's diagnosed. People that have hyperthyroidism tend to have, oh, that was my example, Barbara Bush. Bush the first's wife, okay? Mother Bush. Um, she had, or had, hyperthyroidism and then she was being treated for it when Bush Sr. was president of the United States, okay? And you know that people have it, they got this sort of bug eye look to them. It looks like their eyeballs want to pop out of their head. Right, because there is an increased pressure in the back of the eye that pushes it back, pushes it out. Hypothyroidism, that was the Oprah example, um, would, would make it much more difficult to lose weight and it may actually help you put on weight. So if you're hypothyroidism. There's a autoimmune disease called Hashimoto's disease. And if you have Hashimoto's disease, one of the glands that it attacks is the thyroid gland. So typically when you get Hashimoto's disease, it's primarily females, you then start to all of a sudden gain weight. You're like, whoa, I've never, you know, I gained 20 pounds in the last two months. But you haven't changed your diet. And so the, your own immune system is attacking the thyroid, causing it to produce less T3 and T4 than normal, and you put on all kinds of weight. And then there are other problems associated with Hashimoto's too. So that's another example. So this is the negative feedback loop. You don't have to know this. I'm not gonna ask you, this is more physiology. Just know the basics. So this is a goiter. So you see how this woman has these buggy eyes, okay? She's got um, hyperthyroidism. And then this guy does too. If the T3 and T4 problem or TSH problem occurs when you're growing, in other words, it's not something that's late onset, then you have, this is where getting back to Teresa's question, is there any other way to become a dwarf? Yeah, if you're hypothyroidic when you're a small child, you won't grow normally. And then you'll have mental disability too. Their IQs tend to be a lot lower than the average person. So this is another, this person doesn't have a problem with growth hormone, he didn't have enough thyroid hormone being produced, T3, and so he's a dwarf. Questions? Parathyroid, we've already done this, right? We did this when we did bone, so this is the exact same graph, you should know it. You needed to know it for that, same thing. We've already talked about this, so does anybody want a review of this? The one that I gave you, I had you modify, right? So I'll just review the modifications because some people got these wrong on that exam. You would add, right, here is the calcitonin. You would add the, the nodules, the four nodules for the parathyroid gland in here. So you'd have an arrow coming in here. And you would have an arrow coming down that said producing less PTH, right? Because it's the decrease in the PTH that causes 
the bone to be able to take up more calcium. In a human, the calcitonin does very little, right? And then you should know what the consequences of this part of the diagram and this part of the diagram are on osteoblast, osteoclast, and osteocytes. I'll just do one. You have all of this. You just have to look at it again. On this end, when your blood sugar is too low, right, your osteoclast, blood sugar, excuse me, blood calcium is too low, right, your osteoclasts are off the charts, their activity goes up, osteoblast activity goes down, and the osteocyte activity probably stays the same. And so therefore, you're going to break down bone. Right. Remember, calcium is very, very important for anything that gets secreted or contracts in the human body. So that's why you have to access it. This type of thing, if it goes on too long, would cause osteoporosis. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, Alex. 9 to 11 milligrams for 100 mil. That's on there, too. And I know I asked that question about 50-50 on the first exam. The adrenals, right? Right above the kidney, um, there's two parts to this. Remember what I said in, in anatomy when you say a cortex, it's always the outside of the gland. So the cortex in the brain is the outer portion where the functional areas are. The cortex in the adrenal gland is the outer portion and then the cortex and the kidney. It's always the outer portion. Oops, that's not what I wanted. No, 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 sorry. So um, in the adrenal cortex, that's where ACTH has its effect. So the adrenal cortex, part of it, is what produces cortisol. This is where cortisol is produced. Now, there are three portions to the cortex. We're going to break it down for you. Okay. We'll talk about that in a second. The very middle of the adrenal gland is where the nervous system comes in. And that causes the production of epinephrine, which is another stress hormone. Okay? So the outer portion produces cortisol. The inner portion produces epinephrine. The outer portion is subdivided into three parts. Emergency situations, we already talked about the fight or flight before, right? You know what that is. The nervous response is always first, right? And then you're going to get the epinephrine response, and then you're going to get the cortisol response. Cortisol is the last of the three because unlike the nervous system, and epinephrine, right? Epinephrine is a peptide hormone. Cortisol is a steroid hormone. So the effects of cortisol take longer. So you're going to get the brain, you know, let's say a bomb went off right now in the, in the building, right? Everybody was shot, running around. First thing would happen is your brain, your nervous system would go into fight or flight. All that stuff would happen. Second thing would happen is your adrenals would start producing epinephrine. And then the cortisol would come. But the cortisol's effect wouldn't be felt for a little bit. It takes time, right? It sort of prolongs the process. OK, so it produces, the adrenal cortex produces mineral corticoids. OK, and that the mineral corticoid, the most important one that you need to know is called aldosterone. Sorry. Aldosterone helps your kidneys reabsorb sodium chloride. That becomes really important when you get to the kidney uh, next semester. Glucocorticoids, uh, cortisol is the primary one. You just need to know the primary one. Okay. There's, there's minor ones, but we're not going to get into that. Now, problems with glucocorticoids. JFK has Addison's disease. If you take a look at pictures of JFK when he was very young in the military, in the Navy, he's very, very thin. Okay? All the Kennedys are very, very thin and tall. Part of that was genetics, but part of that was um, 
because he had Addison's disease. He wasn't producing enough cortisol. Okay. Then, by the time he became president of the United States, they started injecting him with artificial cortisol. Okay, because they wanted to normalize it. But this was at the early part. This is basically right, late 50s, early 60s, and they didn't understand how to do this quite yet, so they overdosed him. And if you take a look at him in the White House, if you compare the two pictures, you'll see that his face was puffy. Okay, he was puffy. And that was because that's what too much cortisol will do. So they took him from Addison's disease, which is not having enough cortisol, to human-induced Cushing syndrome. Medically induced. They basically cause Cushing syndrome. Because that's the other side, that's the flip side of the coin. Cushing syndrome is having too much cortisol. So those are the two extremes. So that man went through both extremes because at that, that point in our history, we just didn't understand how to regulate it. If you have one of these now, it's no big deal. They totally get how to do this. They can very quickly fix it. And within a month or two, you're, everything's where it needs to be. Whereas 1959, 1957, they just didn't do it. They didn't know how. So here's an example of somebody with Cushing syndrome. I won't get into the difference between a syndrome and a disease. It's just, let's not worry about it. This boy had a tumor that was producing too much cortisol. So if you produce massive amounts of cortisol, what ends up happening? Well, what ends up happening is you're going to add more fat. You're going to retain a ton of water. Okay, retain a ton of water. And you're going to start losing muscle and bone. So it's this kind of weird dichotomy where parts of your body look chubby and puffy and parts of your body look almost like anorexic. It's really weird if it goes on long enough. In this case, um, they removed the tumor from wherever it was that was producing the cortisol and this is what he normally looks like. So you can see it makes a huge difference. Okay. But that's for a disease that's producing massive amounts of cortisol, not slightly elevated cortisol, right? All right, pancreas. Um, remember that the pancreas is both an exocrine and an endocrine organ. Exocrine, we talked about the digestive system and the juices, right? The enzymes. We're gonna talk about the hormones here. So the two major hormones, there are three, um, we'll just stick with the two, are insulin and glucagon, we sort of talked about them before. Insulin is released when your blood sugar is high. Um, normal blood sugar should be somewhere between 70 and 100 milligrams per deciliter. And ideally, 100 is creeping. If, you're, if your blood sugar is in the 90s, it's pretty high. It's still within the normal range, but it's not great. Um, if your blood sugar goes over 120, if it's greater than 120 at fasting, meaning when you get up and you haven't eaten anything, you're a diabetic. And anything between 100 and 120 is what's called pre-diabetes. Ideally, everybody in this room should be in the 80s somewhere. If you're an athlete, maybe you, you, you are in the 70s. Lower is better. Now, too low is not good. Like thinking, oh, I'd go lower than 70. You'll pass out. Hypoglycemia, right? Hypoglycemia, having not enough sugar in your blood is actually more dangerous than hyperglycemia. This is a form of hyperglycemia. Why is that? Because people can have massively high blood sugar levels and not ever know. If you have a low blood sugar level, you know. You may pass out, okay? It could kill you. Both of them can kill you, but hypoglycemia can kill you in short term. Hyperglycemia usually kills you long term. It means it takes years and years and years for it to happen. 
Okay. So hypoglycemia is something that's very, very dangerous. Um, but most of you should be somewhere in the 80s. If it's in the 90s or 100s, it's too high. Okay. All right, glucagon the, does the opposite. If your blood sugar is too low, glucagon is going to help you release the glycogen and turn it back into glucose. Um, it has some other catabolic activities, but it's not as strong as cortisol. So think about it. Cortisol and, and I've said this before, cortisol and glucagon have some of the same superpowers, except that cortisol, they're much more potent. Glucagon typically doesn't start breaking down bone and muscle and fat. It typically only goes after glycogen. The other one goes after whatever it has to. Question. Basic stuff here. All right, let's talk a little bit about diabetes. So liver cells cannot take in glucose. The two major areas that you store blood glucose as glycogen is your skeletal muscle and your liver. If you want to eat more sugar, move more. The more you move, okay, the more active you are, the more sugar you can eat because one, you can store more of it, the, the storage capacity increases, and two, you burn more of it. So there's a saying in the fitness world that says you've got to earn your carbs. That's kind of true. In, in a sense, it is. The more you want to eat of them, the more you've got to move. You eat less, you don't eat as much. All right. So liver cells, skeletal muscle cells can't take in the glucose. Your cells are starving. Diabetes is a starvation disease. Now, if I ask you, the average diabetic, if you know someone that's diabetic, someone that knows someone that's diabetic, raise your hand. Okay, somebody describe, Brittany, just describe what that person physically looks like. No names, just what do they physically look like? They're normal. Okay, are they a type 2 or a type 1 diabetic? They're type 2. Anybody else know a diabetic? Yeah, what do they look like? They're larger. Anybody else know a diabetic that's larger? No? How about you, Eliza? Yes? Yes? Okay. There are two different diseases. The type 1 diabetic, okay, the pancreas doesn't produce enough insulin. So either they had a virus, that's the most likely scenario. They got sick when they were young, a virus, we don't know which, okay, attacked the beta cells and destroyed most of them. This used to be called juvenile diabetes. The reason we don't call it juvenile diabetes anymore is because it doesn't just happen to small children. My very first class, anatomy class, I had a student who was diagnosed as 21 years old with type 1 diabetes. So it can happen, it's very rare. But that's where the cells of the pancreas get destroyed. So you can't physically produce enough, or any at all. Those people, typically look very, very thin, like a rail thin, right? Because they're starving, right? They can't get the blood sugar into the muscle. They can't get into the bone, okay? Type 2, which is the very common one, those people tend to be larger. Why? Because the fat cells, fat is your largest endocrine hormone. The fat cells, especially this kind around the omentum, the visceral fat, is toxic. And that, those fat cells actually produce hormones that prevent the receptors that respond to insulin from functioning. It's a receptor problem. What's causing the type 2 diabetes? The adipocytes. The adipocytes. Too many of them. So that's why you get this disparity when you say, what does, a type, what does a diabetic look like? If you know a type, a true type one, they're usually pretty thin, usually. If you know type twos, yes, Galen? Um, I was just curious, my um, mom had gestational when she was pregnant. Yes, that's the third, that's the third. Is a, that just hormones because of the pregnancy? Yes, or? no, it's not hormonal. So there's another, there's two other types of diabetes. There's actually three other types. One of them is called gestational diabetes. When women get pregnant, 
sometimes they become diabetic. It's temporary, it goes away as soon as the pregnancy goes to term. Part of it is a problem with just getting too big. So that, it's a form of type two. Sometimes it is hormonal though. Pregnancy, trust me on this one, pregnancy does a lot of weird things to women, okay? And hormones get all out of whack. So it can be either or, because there are women that don't get very large when they get pregnant that still can get it. So it's not just the adipocytes. So yes, but it goes away. If if it's, if it's due to just the hormones, if it's due to massive weight gain that never comes off, it may not go away. Does that make sense? There are other forms of diabetes. Alzheimer's disease and dementia are now starting to be referred by some physicians as type 3 diabetes. You can't get the blood, in the, the sugar, into the brain, into the neurons, and they start starving. And they don't like that because they, they work primarily on sugar. They will work on ketone bodies too, but they don't like it. So that's another issue. But it's sort of a thing that's on the fringe now. The other one is called diabetes insipidus. Okay? And that one is actually a water disease. And diabetes insipidus. Um, they drink lots of water. Their water regulation is all screwed up. So, but it still has to do with sugar. I'm not going to ask you all those different types. I just want you to know that pri pri primarily that diabetes, the cells are starving, and the person is hungry. Yep, Maddie. Um, if, let's say you have diabetes already, you have diabetes already. Yes, if you have diabetes already, does it affect the baby? Yes, it does, right? It's because it's now more difficult for you to regulate your blood sugar. Does that make sense? And now the your metabolism has changed. So it, if a woman becomes pregnant and she's already diabetic, she has to be much more careful and she has to go to the doctor much more often because it's precarious, right? Because you can definitely affect the, the baby. So you just, it's more careful, whereas the average normal healthy you know, woman you know, has to go for only a certain number of checks. You now have a pre-existing condition. You have to go for multiple checks. It'd be the same if, you know, if you had a heart condition. It'd be the same if you had an autoimmune condition. You'd have to go to the doctor more often. You may have to get more sonograms. You may have to have more ultrasounds because you're a high-risk pregnancy. That's what they call it. That makes sense. It, you can do it, and everybody would be fine. You just have to be more careful about it. That's all. All right. Um, People that are diabetic are always thirsty and they produce a lot of urine. The actual way that that occurs is actually a lot of physiology I don't want to get into, but that's true. The, the first ones to discover diabetes were Hippocrates. The Hippocratic Oath is the oath that physicians take. Okay. And the way that the Greeks would do this is they would actually taste the urine. And if it tastes sweet, they knew that the person had diabetes. Because the sugar is coming out in the urine, so it actually tastes sweet, like eating sugar. That's how much sugar you're losing, a lot. And so that's what's causing, essentially, more urine to be produced. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so these are the two types. Type one is the pancreas doesn't produce enough. Type two is a receptor problem. That's why you have to know what a receptor is and basic functions of receptors because a lot of these diseases for the endocrine system end up being receptor problems. Diagnosis, you give somebody glucose, you monitor their glucose levels and the treatment. I'll show you a graph. So here's the blood glucose, right? This is a non-diabetic. You give them a glucose amount of sugar, sugar drink essentially. Within two hours, a non-diabetic comes back, their blood sugar comes back to normal. The, the typical load that they give you is 70 grams of sugar. Why they pick 70, I have no idea. If you do the same thing to a diabetic, well the diabetic's already starting off higher, right? So this person's at like 110 here. They're sort of pre-diabetic, actually. 
and it goes up. And then look at this. Three hours later, that person's blood sugar is still high. Right? So if that happens, then they know you have a problem with sugar metabolism. It's a simple test. We can do it here too. All you have to do is give somebody a sugar load, you take their pre, um, you take blood, you pinch their finger, you get a glucometer, right? You see what it is before, and then you test like every half hour for four hours, and you can tell right away whether they're diabetic or not. It's a simple test to do. All right, thymus gland. So we, we're not going to start anything else today, but we'll finish this. Remember, the thymus gland is underneath the thyroid gland. So this is the thymus. This is the one that helps the T cells mature. This is the one that by the time you're 80 years old is pretty much gone. So 80 years old seems to be an age right around 80-ish when you start losing a lot of things. Okay, where like growth hormone you don't produce anymore, very little, thymus gland is pr pretty much gone. Um, you know, our ancestors probably didn't live to be the age of 80, our ancestors probably lived to be 20, realistically. So these are modern day problems. Uh, the beta, remember the lymphocytes are the beta cells and the T cells. The T cells, once they're made, they're not active until they go through the thymus gland. They have to be activated. And then there's a lot of research here on AIDS and cancer. Uh, the pineal gland of the brain is the one that makes melatonin. We talked about that when we were talking about the brain and we were talking about melanocytes. Um, this is the one that's in the middle of your brain. This is the one that's affected by sunlight. Okay. Aging effects. Lots of these glands end up shrinking. Again, that's just the process of aging. Some do, some, some are shrinking because they're just going to do that. Some do it because of our lifestyle. And we know this because in a lot of um, cultures where they're not, they don't have as much um, technology, where they eat more simply, they live more simple lives, parts of the Far East, um, parts of Africa, uh, parts of Central and South America, they don't tend to have as much of a decline as us, which means that part of it is a lifestyle and not necessarily aging. Um, you can't respond to hormones as well. You have a decrease in thyroid hormone, uh, which would decrease muscle size and metabolism. But you can fix all of these uh, with the right diet and exercise and sleep and all of that. So that's the encouraging news, right? You can age gracefully. That's it. That's all I got for you. So if somebody would turn on the lights. Three most important things from the endocrine system. I'm going to keep it to Vivian. Yes, know the difference between the two. I'm going to try to keep it basic with this stuff, right? Diagrams, if I ask for a diagram, draw me one of the simple ones I drew. Know the essential dogma. With diabetes, you know, I gave you all this complicated stuff. Keep it simple. I'm going to try to ask simple questions. Oh, and another thing I'm going to do for you, I might as well tell you now. So, on the final, the way it works, and I'm going to reiterate this next week, is half of your final is going to be review. The other half is new stuff. For all of the new stuff, okay, for all of the new stuff, no reading. It's all gone. I took it all away. Only my lectures, okay? So, this is an opportunity, like many others, do not blow this. Okay? Do not blow this. No reading for the second half. It's just my slides. Okay? And then, obviously, you're going to review the three exams. If you got things wrong on them, find the right answer, because that question may show up again. And we'll talk about it more, but... That's something to start thinking about, just the slides. All right. Uh, two more things, real quick. Two more important things. Yeah, Tim. Different levels of T3 and T4. Which one is which? Which one's, you know, more important? One more. Yep, Gail. Uh, so 
steroid versus peptide Yeah, and all the differences. I, I talked to you lots of differences. What molecules look like, how they function a little bit different. Basic stuff. All right, have a great day. Yes, me. I may have an exam answer. For this one, it says, which are both subranges or both subranges or both subranges or both subranges. I thought subranges would just be the price kind of trickle down from the left. They're all subranges. Okay, so I thought these were subranges of the left criteria. Is the way I interpret it because I have those two. I don't know. I mean, that's. Technically not true, but it's I get I see where you might you might do that. Okay. I didn't specify. Okay. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Oh, excellent. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, how are you? Good, how are you? Fantastic. Well, I mean, I don't know. The, the answer is because I don't have any of the, the lab grades, so, okay. but I can, sh we can go through what you, I can give you a tentative lecture and say where you're at. That I can do for sure. Uh, 3,300, let's see what we got. So Vivian, you're in section one. All right, so we're down here. Okay, I think you're all right. I mean, I. I mean, so if your goal is just to pass, <laughs> yeah, then you're Wait. you're not. This is these are your grades. Yeah. Then you're not in any. I mean, how did you do on the labs? All right. Uh, yeah. Then you should be fine. Okay. Um, if your goal is to get an A, that's a different story. Yeah. Um, so you're you're probably right now you're sitting at some kind of a in the lab in lecture. You're probably sitting at some kind of like high. C give or take with some extra points, right? Because I haven't factored any of these in yet. I'll do them at the very end. So you're probably sitting in some of the And again, I haven't seen any the lab grades, so I don't know. And yeah, plus you've got, you know, 300 points left with the last lab exam and, and, and the lecture final. So as long as you do well in those, I don't, you're not going to have any problems. I right? just keep doing whatever you're doing. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Uh, you're welcome. Okay. Yes, sir. We found Disease, like, so that's hyperthyroidism too, right? Because I know what the hyper is, so he has thyroid removed. Yes. Yeah. So it's kind of the same situation as like a, almost like a goiter, not really, but yeah. he, he just couldn't gain weight, so um, he got some graves, right? Is that yes, that graves. That's what that's what um, the uh, Martha Bush. Graves. Uh, I don't know. I gotta check, but no, I gotta. I always forget to shut this thing off, so it. I got that. Uh, Thank you.